So in this uh, Ishavasya Upanishad retreat, we will talk about another verse, another shloka of the Ishavasya Upanishad, shloka <clears throat> number 15, and we will discuss it. Hiran mayena patrina satyasya pihitam mukam tatvam pushana pavrinu satya varma yadrishtaye. <coughs> the face of truth is covered by a golden lid. Remove all sun that covering for me, the practitioner of truth, so that I may behold it. This is uh, more than talking about belief, or you have to believe in this, or believe in that, or accept this statement from somebody, like many institutional religious attitude. Here we see a direct uh, testimony from somebody who directly experienced directly experience truth. He talked from the Rishi here talk from his direct vision. It's not second-hand uh, wisdom, second-hand knowledge, second-hand information, but is to share something that happens in him directly. So this is very valuable. This is like Shankaracharya say in his commentary to the previous verse that here begin a prayer. This is the beginning of a prayer that will take mantra 15, 16, 17, and 18, the four last mantras of the Upanishad. And Shankara say that this is a prayer especially for in the, those who practice karma and meditation, and they are in their last moments before death. Of course, death don't need to be physical death. There are those who say that spiritual life is about to be ready to die before you die. You can die before you die because the idea is about the death of the egoic phenomenon. You see, you are death as an ego, separated from life. Death is dangerous for those who are alive. They can really be scared about it. But if you are able to die as an ego phenomenon, they don't, death don't treat you anymore. So this is the beginning of a prayer for somebody who is a meditator and reach the most deep levels of meditation and is 
in front of the truth, ready to die, but still he don't die. Something there is there between he and truth. That he say, that covering for me, the practitioner of truth, means the practitioner of truth, the I is still there. He cannot see the face of the truth, it, the truth itself, the reality itself, because it's covered. And he told to it in terms of a light. Yeah. Pushan. Pushan is the sun, but not necessarily the sun that we know and we see every day. In the scriptures, the sun symbolizes the source of life, the source of light and life of all the existence, the self. So we, when, when we see the sun, very all the Western uh, archaeologues and erudites in the beginning when they went to India, they think that all oh, these people pray to the sun, the sun god, but the sun for is a deity only, is, is a symbol. But it's light. So what we see here is that the Rishi is in front of truth, but still there is a vessel between him and the truth. And that vessel is golden, golden vessel. And in certain way, we can say that the light is covered by light. We need to understand that in the meditation, we go from the gross to the subtle. It's a process of awareness, watchfulness, observation, because observation allow us to disidentify from what we observe. If you can observe a table, one thing, one thing is for sure, you are not the table. Because the observation creates a distance between you and the object you observe. Meditation begins by the observation of the physical body, the feelings in your body. And that is one of the reasons that in the beginning of Raja Yoga, Yama Niyama, Asanas, Pranayama, we have the Asana, the Hatha Yoga. The Hatha Yoga is a first step that guides us to Raja Yoga because it's the beginning of the observation. You observe your physical body, your feelings in the body, and as long as you are able to observe your body, you take distance from it, you become the observer, the body becomes the observed, and then you enter to a more deep level of consciousness, that is the thoughts, the mental level. In the mental level, if before the body was the external world and the mind was the internal, at the moment you are able to begin to watch your thoughts, the mind slowly becomes the part of the external or superficial world and you begin to realize the distance between you and the mind and situate yourself more in the emotions. Next steps you begin to observe the emotions and then you realize that the emotions are external and more internal is the energies 
etc., etc., etc. You go from one gross level to the more subtle and the more subtle. Yogis realize directly the physical body, the astral body, the causal body, with all his different koshas, feats, yeah? Pranamaya kosha, manumaya kosha, etc., etc., until the karana sharira or the causal body. So, in all this process, in this verse, the rishi is in front of the last. That is what Shankara say is a prayer before for somebody who go to die, because it's before you merge into the truth, and there is no more spiritual seeker, no more sadhana, no more I, whatever, is the disappearance. Because spiritual life is not about to achieve something or to gain something, but it's about to lose yourself. The most surprising thing is that in the beginning, we go beyond the darkness. Of course, the darkness symbolizes whatever is a degradation, addictions, attachments, etc., etc., the misery. But when you are beyond that darkness and you are so near to the truth, nobody expects to found a veil, golden veil, that is an obstacle of, of light. How can be? And this is the most difficult obstacle because to transcend a veil, a limit that is dark, is relatively easy, is clear at least. I fall. I, I fall in intoxication, degradation, etc. And this, I need to go beyond it. And everybody deep inside want to go beyond. If we can or not, that is something else. But there is the desire, the aspiration to transcend it. But when you are in front of something that is an obstacle, but it's a nice obstacle, it's a golden obstacle. It's an obstacle made of light. It's a total different history. It's to give up not the misery, but to give up the pleasure, the, the pleasure, the, the happiness. It's not to give up the bad in you, but it's to give up the good in you. And remember, you can be tamasic, or rajasic, or sattvic, but the goal is to be transcendental. It's very easy to transcend the gunas if you are connected to me, to the self. So the goal is to transcend even the good, the sattva. In Vedanta we call it sattva guna. So, What we see here is that the Upanishads say that in order to realize the one, not to Advaita, the duality, in order to transcend the duality, we are we need to be ready to transcend not only the darkness, but to transcend the light. Not only the good and the bad, but the good too. It's, not on, it's to transcend this duality. <clears throat> and of what is made this veil? This veil, that is golden, that is light, and beyond it is the truth, that is the reason that in 
¿sí? de Torah in the Agadah of Pesach there is there a beautiful mantras in Hebrew that say Karev Yom, Karev Yom Asheru Lo Yom Belo Laila yeah? you talk about the day will come the day that will be not day and not night not day, not night and that is the truth truth the reality is not day and not night. It's not darkness and not light. Because it's not dual. It's absolute. And the realization of that demands from us to go beyond our dark side because every one of us has a dark side and we understand that we need to go beyond it but to go beyond our enlightened side too means to go beyond any duality duality what is the problem with the duality duality is conflict whenever there is duality there is conflict the realization of our Unity, integration, is the peace. In, in Hebrew we say shalom is peace, shalom. But the word shalem is complete. Only when you are complete, shalem, when you integrate yourself, there is no division. You can be in shalom, peace. And of what is made this veil, golden veil? We have different, we, we move in different levels of consciousness. Manas, chitta, buddhi, ahankar, etc., etc. All this we call it mind, but are the gross levels of consciousness. And we are not aware of all the thoughts, ideas, concepts, conclusions we have, aspirations, desires, hopes, hopes. Many of them go to a very subtle level and these aspirations and, and the nice things, we don't want to fight with them. Everyone, when he reacts violent, aggressive, this understand at least after that is not what the best version of me is not what really I want to be. When somebody cheats somebody else or, or, or lies some after him while he can convince others, justify himself or she, but after a while I think this is not the best version of myself. It's clear that the darkness in me is not something I like and enjoy it. But when we have nice thoughts, beautiful ideas, nice aspirations, the aspiration to be a saint, the thought about myself that I have beautiful sides too, they go and stay in corners, hiding corners of our consciousness. And in some point we meet them before jumping into the truth. And they are beautiful. It's difficult to give it up. They are made of all this uh, prana, because thought is prana. And in order to jump it, we need to be ready to observe them too, to watch too. And only when you are able to be attentive to them, conscious to them is the moment when you are ready. You are ready to put to rest the attention, not in the physical body, not in the thoughts, not in the emotions, not in the energies, not in these subtle thoughts, but in the attention itself. That is the moment that consciousness can be conscious of the consciousness itself. And then you awake, there is an awaken. 
there is an awakening to a totally incredible reality where the subject and the object, the big division, the essential division, become one. Consciousness become the observer and consciousness become the observed simultaneously. And then you merge. You are not anymore you. You are not anymore somebody or something. Only in that state, only consciousness is.